I was at a leadership day uh, this week on Wednesday, and uh, uh, I traveled up to Cheltenham in Gloucester, and it was great to be able to come uh, with other leaders from around the, the uh, south and uh, southern Wales region and to just receive something of God. And um, I was really, really inspired actually to look at discipleship this morning, to look at our call into making disciples. And I, I'd already prepared my message for this week, so that was shelved, and you'll, you'll probably get that next week. But uh, I wrote, I sat down Thursday evening. Uh, Karen had gone out uh, to music practice, and I spent some time with uh, my daughter Zoe on, on Thursday evenings, and we play a game, and then we watch some TV together. And she went up to bed about half past eight, and I sat down at 8.45, and by 9.30, I'd pretty much put this message together, which is really unheard of. But God was just pouring this out into me. And the one thing I couldn't get was the title. And so I just kind of cobbled that together afterwards, because, you know, it's the message that's important, not the title. But I've called it Intentional Missional Disciple Makers. Now, would you turn with me to Matthew 28? We're going to be reading verses 16 to 20. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And uh, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with these words. It's the Great Commission. It says this, I'm reading the NIV. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. They're inspiring words, aren't they? I'm going to move this down here because they this thing creaks, and B, I don't want to fall off it. They're inspiring words, but when Jesus spoke these words, the last thing on his mind was that he wanted to be inspiring. This was not something that he wanted people to write down on a piece of paper, on a, on a postcard, and pin with a magnet onto their fridge. That was the last thing on Jesus' mind. This was a commission. We've just spoken about Isaiah's commission, about when he was called of God and commissioned by God to go and do something specific. This is God's commission. This was God's commission to the 11 disciples there on the hillside, and it is God's commission to every single one of us here in this place today. And I want to ask you a question and I want to start with this question. I don't want you to answer it outright. I want you to think about it and hold it in your heart. When was the last time you led someone to Jesus? You. When was the last time you led someone to Jesus and actively discipled them? I'm not talking about when was the last time you shared the gospel. I'm not talking about when was the last time you put a leaflet through somebody's door. I'm not talking about when was the last time you posted a nice scripture on Facebook. I'm not asking about when was the last time someone put their hand up in church, something which actually the Bible never teaches us to do. I'm talking about when was the last time you actively and intentionally presented Jesus to someone, invested time, invested effort, invested life, into them, led them through the most important decision that they will ever make and saw them saved from a lost eternity and walked with them through those early stages of their walk with Jesus. When was the last time that you did that? And I'm going to be blunt. I'm talking to myself as much as anybody else here. And I say this with love, understanding how difficult it can be. But if we can't answer that question, then we are not fulfilling the commission and the chief directive laid out by Jesus himself for every single believer. 
And if I'm not teaching that, if I'm not encouraging you as a church to do that, then I am failing as a pastor and we're failing as a church. That's the simple truth of it. But I want you to be encouraged today because it is never too late with Jesus until it's too late, if you get what I mean. We can start now, we can make today the first day of the rest of our lives, and we can become intentional about how we share our, our gospel message, how we share our lives into the lives of others. But one of the problems is that there are a lot of misconceptions around, stemming from a huge amount of misteaching over the years. This is not recent, this is something that goes back through time, around the area of leading people to Christ. And this may jar with some of us, and it's jarred with me because I've done it. You see, we use terminology such as accepting Jesus, yet nowhere does the Bible talk about accepting Jesus. Jesus didn't say, accept me. Jesus said, Follow me. Matthew 10, 38. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. We put too much effort into accepting the works, words, and the ways of Jesus when we should be following the works, words, and the ways of Jesus. Accepting is good, but following is intentional. Following requires effort. Following requires direction. Following requires us putting one foot in front of the other and actually doing something. Accepting is what kids do on their birthday. Following, following is what disciples do. Following is contractual. When you get a job, you sign a contract, don't you? And that contract is basically an agreement. You do this, and we will give you this. This is your job. These are your wages. These are your benefits. These are the, the things that we will do for you when you take on this job. And you reach that agreement. You have that contractual agreement And you'll never get very far if you can't grasp that basic concept of life. And it's, it's biblical too. 1 Timothy 5.8 says that a worker is worth their wages. And there are so many other scriptures that extol the virtues of an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. It's that contractual idea, that contractual agreement. And when we enter into relationship with Jesus, we enter into relationship and agreement and contract with him. It's a covenant relationship. It's based on a promise. The entire Christian walk is about God will do this, and so I will do this. Not if I do this, God will do this, but God will do this, and so I will do this. We're not trying to earn our salvation. Romans 6.23 is very, very clear about that. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We are not talking about earning our salvation, but working for the kingdom because of our salvation, because of what we have been given, because we are so grateful for what Jesus has done in our own lives that we can't help but share that with others. Colossians 1.28 says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, I work, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. I've lost myself, bear with me. Christianity is not a spectator sport. You ever been to the swimming pool? You know, sometimes I'll take my kids, or, well, not my kids, Joseph's old enough to go on his own now. But <laughs> I stand in the cubicle with him and help him get changed, and all of those things. But, you know, when he was younger, I might take him swimming. And 
I'm not hugely fond of swimming myself. I'm not built for it. I tend to sink, float. And so I'm happy to sit in the spectator gallery and watch other people doing what they're doing, watch other people swimming and marvel at their athletic prowess. But I, like, I, I prefer to watch than I do to actually do it because I'm not particularly interested in doing it myself. That's not the same with church. We can't have that mindset when it comes to church because church is not a spectator sport. And there's a culture that's arisen in the world and it's been intensified through COVID with the rise of uh, online church and church TV. And, and those things have their place. We do our online Bible study. We have a radio program every Sunday. Those things have their place, but they are not a replacement. They are not a replacement for meeting together and being together in the same space and worshipping together and learning together and experiencing Jesus together and being missional together and being intentional together. We can never replace those things. It doesn't matter what technology we've got, we cannot beat being together. Does the Bible not say, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing? It's not about having people on the seats in the church building. It's about being together and worshipping and learning and moving forward together, all pulling in the same direction. We can't have Netflix church. You know, I pay my subscription and I can watch church and I can feel good about myself because I've had my Jesus fix for this week. We're missing the point if we're looking at it like that. But friends, we have work to do. We have to become intentional and purposeful about our faith. And we have to become missional in practice. The Bible never tells us to give anyone a tract. It never tells us even to invite people to church. And nowhere does it tell us to convert people to our religion. What it does tell us to do, in Jesus' own words, is go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. That's not pastors go and make disciples. That's not evangelists go and make disciples. That is you today, believer, go and make disciples. You see, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but not once did he say that he would make a disciple? Not one. That's our job. That's our side of the contract. And what's the agreement that we enter into when we become Christians? It's that we, he will give us the tools and we will reap the harvest. Does Matthew 9 not say the fields are ripe for the harvest, but the laborers are few? Where are the laborers? We've got to bring the harvest in. He will equip us with the spiritual and we will undertake the practical. Verse 17 then goes on and says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Here we've got these 11 disciples, 11 fellas. They're there on the mountainside confronted with the risen Messiah, the risen Jesus. They had seen him die. They had seen him nailed to the cross. And now here he is talking to them on a hillside. That doesn't happen very often, does it? And I say this with the greatest of respect, but I've conducted a number of funerals and I've never talked with the person afterwards. It doesn't happen. But here they are. And imagine how that feels to them. Confronted, wow, this is Jesus. We saw this happen. We saw him die. We saw him buried. And now here he is talking to us and giving us instructions. You're going to sit up and you're going to listen, aren't you? And yes, the verse goes on to say some doubted, but actually the, the better translation is some hesitated. They worshipped him, but some hesitated. I believe there are other people on the mountainside there following Jesus. They'd come to see what was going on. They'd come to see this spectacle. It wasn't some of the 11 worshipped and some of them doubted. It was the 11 worshipped and some who were roundabout doubted or they hesitated. 
I think our 11 disciples at this point were beyond doubt. But the point I'm making here is that every intentional, missional action comes from a foundational heart of worship. I don't mean it comes from a place of singing a song, though we can worship through music. I mean it comes from a heart that is broken before God. It comes from a heart that is crying out before God and is yearning and is desperate for His presence. It comes from a heart that's that's saying, I want all the Jesus I can cram into me before my heart bursts with love for Him. A heart that says, if I don't have Jesus filling every moment of every day, then end me now because life isn't worth living. It comes from a heart that says, I need Jesus before I need food, before I need water. I need Jesus before everything. I need Jesus around everything. I need Jesus above everything. I need Jesus below everything, behind everything. You get the picture. So let me ask you a question. I, wanna, I want you to think about this and answer it in your heart. This is between you and God, between you and his Holy Spirit. It's easy to worship in church, isn't it? When other people are worshiping, when the, the music's playing and we've, we've got our hands raised. It's easy to do that. But some of us even struggle with that. And we've got to get our hearts right in that. We've got to get ourselves right in a place of worship before God. But the question is this, do you worship when you're alone? And can you worship without music? Can you go into your room and close the door and just worship Jesus? When it's just you and God and sing and cry out to him and adore him and enter into the holy place through his Holy Spirit. Sing in tongues if God's given you that gift. Just cry out and worship him. Do you do that when you're alone? When it's just you and God? Or is that something you say for Sundays and maybe a meeting in the week or something like that? Is that something you say for when you put your favorite Bethel CD on or whatever it happens to be? Or do you do that when it's just you and God? True, heartfelt worship is always the springboard to mission and the pathway to purpose. Colossians 3, 16, 17 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whatever you do, You say, there's the spiritual, there's your heart of worship, and then here comes the practical. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. What we do must come from a place of worship. Move on, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now we're getting to the meat of the matter. If worship is putting strength to your arm, then authority is the hammer that hits the nail. Jesus was a man of authority. He stated it here in this verse, and the inference in his words is that our authority is now being assigned to his followers. That's me and you. Of course, this became evident in Acts chapter 2, didn't it? When the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falls falls on the believers and they start to move in the power and authority of God. It's been said of power and authority that uh, it's it's like a sheriff. You know, and the authority is the sheriff's badge and the power is is the, the gun. The authority, without the authority, without the badge, is just a bloke with a gun. Without the gun, the authority has got no legs, it's got no substance. Let's look at the authority of Jesus for a moment. In Mark 4, 35, Jesus calms the storm. He shows there clearly that he's got authority 
over nature. In Mark 5, 15, uh, 1 to 15, Jesus delivers a demon-possessed man of his demons. He displays authority over the spiritual realms, over the powers of darkness. In Mark 5, 25, Jesus heals a woman with the issue of blood. Pastor Gareth spoke about this a few weeks ago, didn't he? A long-term illness showing that he has authority over sickness. And in Mark 5, 38, Jesus raises that young girl from the dead, showing that he has final authority over death. Oh, but he's Jesus. He's Jesus. Of course he can do these things. I want you to realize today that the same God, the same Jesus who said all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me, also said, behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. You have authority and you have the power of Jesus inside of you through his Holy Spirit. And that needs to be channeled into making disciples. It's time to stop, church. It's time to stop trying to be nice, pleasant, defensive Christians. We've got to start taking ground from the enemy. I will not. I will not accept that I have loved ones who are going to a lost eternity. I will not accept that I have friends and colleagues who are going to... Well, maybe not colleagues in my example, hopefully. But I will not accept that I have friends who are going to a lost eternity. I will not accept that there are things going on in the world that are contrary to the word of God. I will not accept that. I will stand. I will stand in the name of Jesus. I will stand under the power of the blood of Christ. I will stand full of his Holy Spirit in power and might. And I will step forward and I will take ground from the enemy. Amen? We've got to stop being defensive Christians and start going on the offensive. Not being offensive, but being offensive. Therefore, verse 19, go and make disciples of all nations. This is it. This is the big ask. And I've been praying about this since Wednesday. Because I've got to put some legs to this, otherwise it's, it's just a nice challenging sermon, isn't it? I've got to put some legs on this. I've got a challenge for me and for you. Every one of us, no exceptions. Every single person here in this room, every single person watching who's online today, every one of our number who's not here because they've got COVID or because they're away with parents or children today or whatever it happens to be. I really feel that this is of God. Between now and New Year of 2023 is nine months. Now where's this year going, eh? I'm still writing 2022 when I write, uh, 21 when I write the date. But it's nine months to the end of the year. And I want to challenge Every single one of us here in this place today to commit to making one disciple. One, just one. Not Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, just one. Between now and the end of this year, one disciple. You see, the commission of Jesus to make disciples were not just for those on the mountainside. It was for all believers from that day to this and onwards. Every one of us, whatever your ministry gifting, whatever your uh, calling, whether you're an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, an apostle, a prophet, a helper, a worship leader, a youth leader, or none of the above, the call to make disciples is for you. I've heard it said that the church is like a hospital, you know, where the, where the sick can come. And yeah, absolutely. But you know, we who follow Christ, we're not the patients. We're the doctors and nurses. We're the ones administering Jesus. We're the ones administering the Holy Spirit and bringing him into the lives of those who are struggling, those who are dying, those who are lost. That's our call. Whether you've been a 
Christian for five minutes or whether you've been a Christian for 50 years plus. This call is for you today. And I'm giving you this challenge. Think of a person. Would you, would you just um, humor me for a moment? Close your eyes. And I just want you to think of somebody. Just picture somebody on your heart right now. Think of a person you know. Or if you're super spiritual, ask God to bring along someone who you don't yet know. Write their name. When you get home, write their name on a post-it note or stick it to your fridge or on a note on your phone or your iPad or whatever you use. But more importantly than that, write their name on your heart. I'm sure all of us know somebody. And just write their name on your heart right now. And commit now between you and God to seeing that person brought forth as a disciple of Jesus Christ this year. This year. This is manageable. This is achievable. I'm not going to go through the smart profile. You can open your eyes. Or is it specific, manageable, achievable, realistic, and time scale? Yeah, it works. We've got all of those things. Who's fed up with smart things in work? And then we've got another job to do. When we're intentionally, intentionally making a disciple for Jesus, we've got to fix our nets. Matthew 4, 18 to 22, says Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers called uh, Simon, called Peter and Andrew, his brother. And they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, was their father. And they were mending their nets, and he called to them, and immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Why do you mend nets? Why do fishermen, I mean, you may, you may or may not be a fisher person, but why do we mend nets so the fish don't get away? It's that simple, isn't it? My daughter's got a fish tank in her room. When we clean the tank out, we've got a little net. And you chase them around the tank and you scoop them out and you plop them into a jug of water. And then you take the tank and you clean it. But if the net's got a hole in the bottom, I'm never going to achieve what I need to achieve, am I? I'm never going to catch that fish. We've got to mend our nets, church got to fix our nets. Fixing our nets is about the behaviors that we display, the words that we speak as we make disciples. These are the things that catch the fish that Jesus was talking about. We have to strike the right balance. Don't get intrusive and in people's faces the moment they walk through the door, whether that's in church or in our homes or workplaces or whatever it happens to be. Don't get in their face the moment you meet them. Be friendly, be welcoming. If you spend more time telling people about you and about your accomplishments and about your life than you do telling them about Jesus or in fact talking at them rather than listening to them, this is a skill, believe me, then we've got a hole in our net. They're going to get away. We're going to be losing fish. We've got to live as an intentional disciple maker. Let your life speak as much as your words about the work of Jesus. And I want to give you very three, three very, very quick, simple steps that we need to have on our heart when we're helping people to become disciples. Belong, believe, behave. There you go, they all start with the same letter. Should be easy to remember. Belong, believe, and behave. Belonging, sometimes belonging happens before believing. And sometimes it happens that believing happens before belonging. Belonging is about making people feel welcome, making people feel part of the family, whoever they are, from whatever background they're from, either in church or with us in a personal capacity or both. Romans 17, uh, sorry, 15, 7 says, accept one another then. 
just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Church should be a place where any person of any background, of any ethnicity, of any creed, of any social status, any gender, any educational history, whatever problems, whatever anxieties, whatever troubles, should be able to come and immediately experience warmth, acceptance, and love. The Bible tells us to love our neighbor. And that includes anybody with lifestyles that we might find distasteful. cultures that are different to ours. It even goes on to say that we should love our enemies too. In the same way, I don't think I've got any enemies. I've got people that I'm not keen on. I've got to work on that. I don't think I've got any actual enemies. Well, maybe I have. I don't know. Maybe I just don't know about it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe people have got me as an enemy. I don't know. Whatever. I'm happy. Jesus said, even love our enemies. Here's a challenge. If you're faced with Vladimir Putin today, do you love him? It's the reality of the love of Jesus. Even he is not beyond redemption. This isn't compromising scripture. It's making disciples and living scripture. These guys over here, Sam, Mandra, their team, they do that so well. We can learn a lot. And then there's believing. Sometimes, as I said, this happens before belonging. Sometimes it happens after belonging. But when, whenever we're discipling someone, there must come a point where we verbalize the gospel. And then whether it's in a quiet place on our own or whether it's with you one, one, you know, sometimes, you know, people can come to Jesus on their own without anybody leading them through a sinner's prayer. There's another thing that's not in the Bible. But people can come to Jesus on their own. But whether it's on their own, whether it's with us one-to-one, -one, whether it's in a church meeting or gathering or whatever it is, Every person has to come to a point along their discipleship journey where they express their belief in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 to 13. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Listen to that. How many of us have struggled with shame in our lives? to Jesus, you'll never be put to shame. Never going to look at you and say, oh, sorry, but look at what you've done. Often I hear people describe themselves as sinners. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm just a sinner. You know what? Jesus doesn't see that when he looks at you. Jesus sees his son. He sees Jesus when he looks at you. Sees the blood that his son shed when he looked at you. You go to God and say, I'm a sinner. He's going to go, where? I, I can't see anything. I haven't got anything written down here. We can't persuade someone into believing. We can't scare them into believing. We can't force them into believing. But we can love them with the love that Jesus had. And we can let him draw them in. And then there's behaving, belonging, believing, and behaving. This is about living the Christian life. Important to note here that it's the, it's the Holy Spirit who changes people's hearts. It's the Holy Spirit who makes sin distasteful to us. It's not our tutting or our shaking of heads. It's not convicting somebody of sin. It's what the Holy Spirit does. That's just... Showing someone our distaste. That's not loving. Peter wrote to the early church. You see, we, we can guide people lovingly into the truth of Scripture. Of course, there has to be effort. There has to be will 
when it comes to certain things. But the Holy Spirit leads us in that. It's the Holy Spirit who sanctifies. And Peter was writing to the early church. In 1 Peter, it was a church that was struggling. It was under persecution from Rome. And right at the start of the letter, he says, God's elect exiles, that's the Christians, scattered throughout the provinces, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. God knows who's going to come to him and who isn't. Through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, to be obedient to God, sprinkled with his blood. Just wonder, Sam, could you get the Sunday school kids in for us? Sam Percival. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 says, You also were included in God when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. One disciple, one disciple this year, one disciple. I'm too busy. The Bible doesn't make allowance for that. But you don't know my workload. The Bible doesn't make allowance for that. Make a disciple at work. Use what you've got. One disciple. This is where our intentional, missional calling needs to start. And then one will lead to another. And then your disciples will start to replicate what they've taught, and what they've been through, and they will start to make disciples. And then before you know it, we've reached the ends of the earth. Time's too precious. Time is too precious to let this go. Souls are too valuable to ignore this. I said a couple of weeks ago that if I said to you, go to hell, you'd be offended, and rightly so. But we say that to people every time we fail to share the love and the message of Jesus when we have an opportunity. Time is precious. Will you stand up? And will you be counted today? Will you be counted before Jesus as an intentional, missional disciple maker? Oh, it's not much of a Mother's Day message. Sorry, but not. Genuinely, because this is what God put on my heart for you today, church.